Charlotte Amalie, the heart of Rock City, St. Thomas, and the capital of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Named in honor of the wife of King Christian V of Denmark, the town is known for its deep water harbor. It's for this reason that it is said to have been a haven for pirates, and why today it is a famed cruise ship port of call. But even with its advancements and modern day commerce, Charlotte Amalie still holds its historic charm. Throughout the town, centuries old buildings and structures still exist, allowing residents and visitors alike to experience the town as it was during its colonial period. And it's buildings like this one that will be the focus of today's show. Hello everyone, I'm Janisha John and welcome to another episode of Rediscover St. Thomas. Now today we're taking a break from the hiking and nature tours to explore and learn about the historic buildings that are significant in this town. Today we'll be touring Black Bear's Castle, a national historic landmark to learn of its piratized historic manor houses, and beautiful botanical gardens. Our guide today is Mr. Felipe Ayala, and he's already waiting for us, so let's not keep him waiting. Let's go. Felipe Ayala is an expert when it comes to this area and many of the historic sites on the island. Good Hi, day. How are you? Welcome. I'm Janisha. Hi. Welcome to the day in the Blackbirds. Yeah, this is Black Bear's Castle. And I know it to be a bed and breakfast. Could you tell us a little bit more about the importance of this building? Well, do you know what's really funny about it? The, the tower was originally called Skytsborg Tower. or Skytsborg? Skytsborg, which okay. translates in Danish to Sky Tower. And was really a watchtower for the harbor. Today it has the popular lore of the Black Bear, the pirate Edward Teach who um, roamed our waters, not necessarily the Danish West Indian waters, but the Caribbean in general, and the tower is named after him as a sort of an island lore. But it really had nothing to do with piracy. Um, the tower was really built as a watchtower to see what enemy ships were sailing into the harbor, and also to protect against an invading force landed on the Great North Side Bay, popularly known as Megan's Bay today. If an opposing force was landed there and came over the hill, Blackbird's Tower was sort of like your first line of defense to protect the small Danish colony against that. Okay, so would it be considered relative to like a fort? It's part of the fortification system mm -hmm. um, built by the Danes. Keep in mind that according to 16th and 17th century warfare, mm -hmm. Fort Christian, our oldest known building, was not adequate enough to protect the island. Okay. So this tower served as a watchtower, and then there were two smaller batteries at the entrance to the harbor that sort of fortified the Danish colony. Okay, now, in, in this building itself, what are some things that we will be seeing today and learning about? Oh, well, this is my favorite neighborhood. The city of Charlotte Amalia is built on three hills divided by two natural gutters mm -hmm. and then divided again into quarters, which are Danish subdivisions. Okay. Our tour today will be in the oldest section of town, which is called Congen's Quarter. Congen's Quarter? Yes, or okay. it translates into um, English as King's Quarter. King's Quarter. The other two are Dronigans and Crown Princes, or Queens and Crown Prince. Um, Crown Prince's Quarter. And We'll take a look at the merchant homes in this area, kind of get a sense of what life was like back in the okay. 17th and 18th centuries, and give you a glimpse into some of the period details of the homes in this area. Okay, well, I'm excited to take it's a, a great look back in so <laughs> let's go. Okay, right. we'll start this way. Our first stop on this walking tour is Villa Notton. It was built in the 1800s by a Scottish engineer. Today, it's one of 16 houses in Charlotte Amalie that was built using the stone brick method. Well, welcome to Villa Notman. Villa Notman? Yeah. This house was built in 1861 mm -hmm. as the home of Robert Notman. He was a Scottish engineer who came to help work on the West Indian Company dock as we know it. In those days, it was called the French dock. Okay. But he built the house here, and the house is one of 16 built in a stone and brick um, construction method. Most of the buildings prior to that were built out of rubble masonry mm -hmm. or wood. But then around 1848, with the, the start of the Anglican Cathedral, 
It was also the same year as the, um, the emancipation of slavery. Okay. Um, a new construction style came in, which was very chic and very popular for that era. And it used native stone called blue bitch, trimmed with yellow ballast brick, used to weight the house of ships okay. from sailing from Europe to the Caribbean and offloaded here. The bricks were sold for a very high building price, so you kind of had to have some coin to be able to build one of these houses. But this was one of 16 houses in Charlotte Amalia, okay. okay. built in this architectural style. So in the museum properties on Black Bear Hill, we're fortunate to have different examples of architectural styles, and then this one being one of our showcase because of the yellow brick and stone construction. Okay. And when you think of the colors, um, like the yellow, the ochre color brick, mm -hmm. with our beautiful native stone, which is the, the deep blue, yeah. it, um, it sets it off. And all the buildings are Caribbean Georgian, hip roofs, cornices, all the classical details. So the brick and the stone really work well together. Uh, so who maintains and owns this building now? Well, this house is owned by the Virgin Islands Inns, um, which is Vernon and Michael Ball, father and son team. Okay. And what they did was they bought a series of houses. They are the original owners of the Hotel 1829, okay. and which was in St. Thomas, a landmark okay. for its um, fine culinary experiences. But they saw an opportunity to introduce residents to our island and um, guests, um, tourist guests, to what St. Thomas was like. We realized at that time that there are a lot of people that did not know about St. Thomas' historic past. So they created a series of tours offered on cruise ships and to locals alike, um, showcasing our rich history, our period furniture. Mm -hmm. And we give a sort of an introduction here um, onto antique furniture, objects of art, art, and flora and fauna, architecture. So all of the, by the time people get ready for their shopping experience on Main Street. They live, they know here. They're they like, know oh, here, except they're from here. <laughs> <laughs> they're one of us. Okay. Now, according to Ayala, the layout of Villa Notman honors its curator, Philip Sturm. The villa is also furnished with the many antique pieces from Sturm's collection, which is said to be one of the largest collections of Caribbean antique furniture. Ayala says Sturm's collection was actually started in the 1940s by his mother who began collecting old furniture pieces people threw out. Pieces like this living room suite, which Ayala says is the most important piece in the villa. The tea table um, is also from Barbados and it's a really wonderful one because it has very interesting legs. Okay. Um, there's a lot of zoomorphic influences in furniture mm -hmm. and these are snake head feet on pads. So when you look at the tea, it, um, look like a it looks like snake a snake head. Yeah, um, <laughs> coming out. And then it sits on a pad, mm -hmm. just giving it a nice look. But the table is also a tilt top. When not in use, there's a pin on the bottom that you can pull it, flip the top up and push it against the sides of the wall. Okay. And what about this chair here? This chair, this is one of my favorite chairs. This is from the Birch Collection. This chair is made out of lignum vitae. And lignum vitae is one of the hardest known woods. Um, it was used in the making of machine parts, like boat parts and propellers, because it was so hard. And we have lignum vitae trees growing outside. It's an indigenous tree. But notice the lines are very clean, very angular. Because lignum vitae was so hard that you had to carve it while it was green. Once oh. the wood dried, it did not have the saws in the day to cut into the wood. So that's why the lines are very straight. And then we have an uh, antique mahogany plant stand. Okay. It kind of has the spiral turnings of a bedpost. And if you look at it, it's convex concave, which is really skilled. Posts were turned on a lathe. So you notice it has a very thin bead on it. Mm -hmm. That's like a, a signature made on St. Croix, actually, Thurland, which was a very famous St. Croix joiner, a Christian joiner. He was known for posts like that. So tell me, where does the influence, um, the inspiration come to design this furniture like this for those who actually created these back in the day? You know, it's wonderful. Um, there were style books um, from Europe at the time. Keep in mind that these were colonies of European countries. So the plantocracy of that time and the merchant class wanted the furniture they remembered from at home. Mm -hmm. But after the emancipation of slavery in 1848, a lot of local influences came in. The former slaves, now freedmen, who were joiners and craftsmen that made the furniture, mm -hmm. started to look in nature and on the island around them for a lot of the inspiration. So you're going to see fern tendrils and leaves okay. and all of that kind of stuff carved into the furniture. And what's really funny about it is that when the European furniture was made, it had to be perfect. It had to be um, very exact. In the West Indian pieces, one of the things that show that they're handmade and give them their charm today is what we call hand prints. You'll see like where, well, this side looks a little bit like that side, okay. but there's a little um, change in it. So you have all of those things. And today, that's what people look at. You can tell that somebody actually carved it by hand and was inspired. You'll see some of the classical details mm -hmm. like um, 
burgeoning and all of those other elements into the furniture, the Queen Anne legs and the turnings. But then you're gonna see like a sprig of like mahogany leaves or fern leaves or palm leaves or zoomorphic influences like animals. It's, we have a little washstand that has little um, animal feet. So, so okay. yeah, so okay. you can see what, like a goat was running by and somebody was like, oh, well, we'll put that on it. <laughs> but okay. that's what makes the furniture really interesting. That's cool that you use your, your, your natural inspirations from around you, from exactly. things that you saw. And I guess that makes it more relatable to us today. Exactly. So. And they're all West Indian pieces. Now, today, West Indian furniture in the marketplace is like going through the roof. It is one of the most collected um, right. pieces of furniture in terms of the international market. Okay. And it's starting to finally command the prices of for furniture of this quality. When you think they're handmade solid wood, most of them impervious to bugs and termites. Mm -hmm. We really made very, very fine pieces of furniture in the West Indies. And finally, I think everybody here is starting to appreciate the form. The layout of Villa Notman is typical of the 1800s. A large central parlor table surrounded by rocking chairs and other furniture kept along the sides of the walls. Let's say you're entertaining and you needed more space, you can move the table out yeah. and kind of create like a big ballroom big area there. Yeah, in the middle of it. And then what's wonderful, this is a copy, um, it's the only reproduction in the collection, okay. but we honored the local craftsmen that are continuing the trade by having it here. This one was made by George Munson as a copy of Franzi Kulianis's, who's an old local family, okay. um, her parlor table, and it's really, really a wonderful. But George made the furniture out of local mahogany and in the same tradition as the historic pieces were made. So we honor the new joiners, Ambrose Gervier, Kent, um, Kent Lawrence Hughes, um, people like that who are making furniture today. We honor them by having this piece in the collection. This is beautiful. It's really a nice, and you can see the grains in the wood, so it's really wonderful. And then the other side, the dining room. Now this entire floor was originally the living room or the parlor. The dining room for this house was downstairs, opposite of the kitchen. And kitchens in those days were built separately because of the hot heat they gave off mm -hmm. and to keep fire from burning the rest of the house. But because of the tour um, configurations of the house, um, we just made the whole room. And what's really fun about our dining room table is three tables. This is only two of them. Okay. If we added the third one, it would have to go down the center of the, of the room. <laughs> but the tables were from Trinidad. And when the governor's wife of Trinidad in the 40s and 50s was redecorating the mansion, she was going to sell the dining room suite. And Mrs. Sturm, with her eagle eye and social connections, recognized this was happening. So she went into an auction and she bought um, the table. And there are three individual tables that are joined together underneath, and they're all tilt tops. So when not in use, they can just flip up and put, them to the and put them onto the side. And then we have in the corner a, a crucian sideboard. You know, St. Corey was one of the top furniture producers in the really? Caribbean. They made. I don't think people realize how wealthy the, the no. Crucian plantocracy was. So <laughs> they demanded the finest, finest furniture. So St. Croix, Barbados, um, Trinidad, Martinique, they produced some of the finest furniture in the Caribbean. And St. Croix, what's wonderful about the Crucian pieces is that they're clean lines and simplicity. Okay. I mean, the, when you think of our Danish heritage, Denmark is known for just really simple, but the simple. quality of okay. woods and elegance in their furniture, and this is exhibited in that small cushion sideboard. Another piece in the space that definitely needs mentioning is this small stand. Yes, it's plain and may not have much personality, but what makes it a popular piece is the fact that it was touched by a former U.S. president. They used to come here um, when the Clintons were in office um, to go and have like a New Year's kind of retreat and I'm making space. So there was a restaurant. They just used to show up all the time, just show up at a restaurant, secret <laughs> service, drive them crazy. But they went down the hill to Zorba's restaurant. And when everything they ordered off the menu, they were out of that day because nobody expects the president just to okay. show up. <laughs> but that piece, at the end of the day, he was such a good sport about it. He posed with the wait staff of that um, restaurant next to that piece of furniture. And we inherited it shortly after. So it's really, really wonderful. It's famous. It is. <laughs> we'll touch it to make it famous sure again. <laughs> okay, so tell me, I see you have some amazing paintings here on the wall. Could you oh, tell yeah. us a little bit about sure. this? Sure. Well, let's, let me show you this one. This is one of my favorite ones. This is an old print by Fritz Melby, and it shows the three quarters of the hill. So this is Congens, Dronigans, and Corn Princes. And we started right here. This is Skytesburg Tower, or as we call it, Blackbeard's. We're actually in this house. This is Villa Notman. Okay. And this is Crown House right across the street. Okay. And Peter von Schulten lived in that house. And then this is the Hotel 1829 right here. 
This is Hoganson, mm -hmm. and Government House would be in this area. Wow. And then this is historic Catherinsburg. This is the wall for Villa Santa Ana. <laughs> so you kind of can see that nothing's really changed in our town no. in a few hundred years. Everything is for the same. And one of the earliest descriptions of, of life in St. Thomas was that, but J.P. Nissen, who lived right down the street, he was also one of our neighbors. Okay. J.P. Nissen wrote an account of life here in the 1800s, and he said that the, the city of Charlotte Maya was very worldly, that even the slaves were speaking several languages, wow. and that new houses were being built every day, and the harbor was filled with ships. So when you think of St. Thomas in 2010, nothing's changed. Still I mean, it's still, it's exactly, still exactly. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And you can see um, the Danish flag on the schooner. Um, Fort Christian is right there. This is the legislature building, so the fort sits right in the back, and it's painted white. And then the bustling harbor scenes. I always loved this because the artist was so true. Here's a log, log. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and birds and everything. But also our most famous painter is the um, father of Impressionism, Camille Pizarro. Uh -huh. um, this is a print of his. Um, Camille Pizarro was born on St. Thomas. Uh -huh. um, he attended our local synagogue and painted early lights of, um, scenes of life here with another artist called Fritz Melby who did that one. And the two of them were like good boyhood friends. They traveled the Caribbean, went on a little trip together before Pizarro moved to France and founded the Impressionist art movement. So his ability to capture light in his paintings, I'm convinced that it happened because he grew up on, in the Virgin Islands, on St. Thomas. Our beautiful sunshine, sunshiny days and sunlight coming through, he captured in his paintings. So when he goes to Europe and you know you think of gray days and all of that, you can actually see where the light comes the from. Light. What's wonderful about this painting is the Frenchman's Reef Hotel would be right, right here. There. Um, this wow. is a West Indian Company dock. So this is the era where um, Yacht Haven Grand and Eggs is like right over there. That's so you can kind of see where wow. it is today. So it's really <laughs> a wonderful. Uh, it is. <laughs> and you can see they were growing sugar in that area. And when you think of the area, it's called Sugar Estate. Now we know why. Now we know. This is St. Thomas in 1856. We're here in the Villa Nachman's house, and we're standing in what would have been a child's room back in 1861. Now come take a look. This is actual, original pieces of clothing used in those times. A communion dress, and some boots, and gloves. Absolutely amazing. I'm truly impressed. We're just about through with this villa, but there is still one more feature of the house that's worth highlighting. Well, our balcony is probably the most famous asset on this house. The balcony was imported from New Orleans okay. by Mr. Warham, who also imported balconies from Scotland and lived in the other quarter. But when you look at the um, wrought iron balconies and the intricacies of it, you realize how similar it looks to the city of New Orleans. And we have a lot. This one has a very popular garland and flower motif. Mm -hmm. And it was a balcony of choice for the tourism department because they shot an ad campaign for the Virgin Islands really? from this balcony. Okay. And it's also one of two in St. Thomas. The house next door has the same balcony. So we always tease and say they were keeping up with the Joneses. They love the balcony so much that they, <laughs> they, they got to have one not. too. <laughs> <laughs> but we also have our original fountain in the garden. Okay. Um, that one was installed by the Cave family in 1910. And we have an wow. old photograph showing the, um, the, uh, the fountain. Mm -hmm. And the Mr. Cave, one of the descendants of the family, came to St. Thomas one day. This is another funny story. With a picture. He had a picture of his father standing next to this balcony mm -hmm. and his mother sitting by that fountain. And he was asking people downtown, like, where do you know where this is? And nobody knew. The, the first one he was showing was the fountain. Nobody knew where it was. Okay. But there was a gentleman in the post office who used to live in this house named Sam Boynes. Mm -hmm. who saw it. He said, oh, my God, that's my um, house. So he invited them up. And then they, the Mr. Cave took, uh, the descendants, took pictures in the same spots their grandparents were standing wow. in. So it was a really nice story. But the fountain was original. It used to have water lilies with it. And notice it um, has the same yellow ballast brick. And then the wonderful urn. And then our garden is full with mango trees and 
um, the palm trees, tire palm. palm. Yeah. I do recognize yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a house in the other um, quarter called La Tanya because they have the largest stand of tire palms mm -hmm. in the historic district. They have like 27 palm trees in their garden. Wow. 27. So, and, and all of those. And then we also have a bay rum tree with the peeling bark. So we try to introduce a lot of local flora and fauna into the garden. So we have a couple of iguanas in there and mm -hmm. some little birds just for flavor in the garden as well. But, so can we can we actually go down and take yeah, a walk? Yeah, I'm watching you can walk through the gardens, but, and then we also will show you the three queen sculpture. Okay, so we have more exploring to do. All right, great. Okay, we head this way. After a quick walk through the gardens, we come across this beautiful area that was once, believe it or not, an abandoned parking lot. Well, this is my favorite part of the tour. Mm -hmm. These are the three queen sculptures. And this was a gift from the Ball family to the Virgin Islands. Um, they funded the sculpture. Mm -hmm. And this whole area was an abandoned parking lot. It was all really poorly graded and just ugly. And everybody would come to the museums and then they felt that once they came outside the fences, That's it. where am I? <laughs> so I spoke to Michael and his dad one day and I said, you know, I have an idea for a sculpture which will honor the very best of the Virgin Islands. And so you designed this sculpture? I designed this sculpture. Wow. Um, it was cast by Richard Hallier who did all our pirate sculptures and he also did the sculptures at the Olympic Village in um, Denver. So we're very happy to have his work here. But um, the three queens, um, which was Queen Mary, and when we were kids in school, we sang the Queen, Queen Mary, Mary song. Where are you gonna Where burn? Yeah, burn I know. <laughs> <laughs> so the sculpture honors her. Queen Mary is the central figure, and she um, faces St. Croix, which is 40 miles to our south from this location. So um, the three queens, um, they are cast in bronze, and they were unveiled on St. Thomas every Christmas. We have Miracle on Main Street. So the, in 2005, the miracle was the unveiling of the sculpture, wow. and we celebrated it right before um, Miracle on Main Street started. We had a small reception in the garden for it and unveiled the sculpture. So today, this whole area has been gentrified, and you have Queen Mary as the focal point of the garden. So guests coming through the museum tours mm -hmm. are then tour the properties. They exit onto this area because we have another building, Villa um, Britannia, and then we also have Crown House. The governor's mansion is right down the street, so we invite people to come up into this area and see all these wonderful art treasures in the garden. And now it definitely looks like a continuation exactly. rather than a parking lot. Exactly. <laughs> Well, we're heading towards one of my favorites, and you're gonna hear that a lot in this tour. <laughs> like favorite? my favorite, my favorite. I, I love this neighborhood. Okay. Well, one of the th um, the best preserved houses in the district is Crown House. That's the right. Yes, um, okay. it's the home of Robert and Donna de Young today, but historically was the home of Peter von Scholten, who freed our slaves okay. without permission of the Danish king, mm -hmm. and Jürgen Levine Road, also another Danish governor, lived in this house. It's the second oldest house in the neighborhood, um, okay. built in 1740. Okay. But this house has a unique um, love for St. Thomas and history of, um, with St. Thomas because of the two dormers. Every painting that shows the city of Chardamalia in Congens always points out this house because it has the two very recognizable dormers on the roof. So you can always spot, and when we look at the Melby picture, you can always see Crown House because of the two. And it has these wonderful royal palms and the antique lamp fixture um, right over the gate wonderful gate but the de young um, who are architects restored this house so lovingly the restoration took a very long time but this is the end result That's and it's beautiful. truly truly magnificent house exterior and interior okay we're looking at what looks like a million steps <laughs> but this is 99 steps well you know, you have to be from St. Thomas to know this, but there are really 103 of them. 103. <laughs> so like false advertising. Okay. No, <laughs> but there are the 99 steps, and St. Thomas is famous for these step streets. Um, we have 45 of them, but the 99 steps are our most famous because they're the ones made out of yellow ballast brick. Okay. They're the only ones made out of yellow ballast brick. Okay. But as much as we think that the 99 steps or the 103 steps are Great. This is small compared to the step streets in Dronigan's Quarter, which can boast up to 145, 157 steps wow. at a time. Bread Goddess Step Streets, I'm convinced. If you want to do step aerobics, Go. two times. One up, one down. That's all you need. You'll look like you. <laughs> okay. 
But the 99 steps are important to us because they're really unique. Step streets on a whole are unique to the Danish West Indies. Puerto Rico is the only other island in the Caribbean that has a step street. They have one step street next to El Convento. Mm -hmm. We have 40, um, 45 of them. Wow. And that's, because that's... of our, our street, when we were walking down earlier, we were talking about, you know, it's all the hilly, hilly and all that. Yeah. This is why they couldn't create um, roads up to these areas, so they just created a set of step streets called stratas. And so when you think of Danish translation, gata means street, strata, mm -hmm. step street. Step so the famous 99 steps go all the way down That's to Congens. We're standing on top of Dronigan's Gata right now, which is Queen Street. Okay. And at the bottom of the hill, because of the governor's mansion, is Congens Gata, King Street. And the, the treat at the end, because it's worth walking down. At least we're going down the steps. It could have been worse. It could have been running up. Coming up. And we've done that too. <laughs> but um, it's sort of like Charlemagne has the feeling of an old Italian step town, like a hill town, to have these wonderful buildings and then all these step, um, little step streets up and down the steps. Well, it is one thing I do admire about St. Thomas. You know, being able to walk practically almost everywhere in yeah. the town. You know, it's 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 really nice. So it's, I like, I like right. this well, let's, step streets. Let's, let's step in. Yeah, step <laughs> <laughs> There is still so much to see and learn about in this historic area of Charlotte Amalie. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of this show, but not to worry, we'll be back to wrap up this amazing tour of Blackbeard's Castle. So until next time, make sure to cherish your home, these beautiful islands, but above all, cherish each other.